Alan Friedman's solar photography has been featured in NASA's Astronomy Picture of the Day, numerous art exhibitions, and the Royal Observatory of Greenwich. He scored a winning image in the Astronomy Photographer of the Year Awards from the Royal Museum's Greenwich in 2019, and his work and image processing techniques have been the subject of lectures, articles, and interviews. Alan is Research Associate in Astronomy at the Buffalo Museum of Science and past president and current director of the Buffalo Astronomical Association. He generates his work from his backyard observatory using small telescopes and specialized filters. He has appeared on NBC's Today Show and given a TEDx talk on his work, and I'm pleased to have him on the show to talk about his experiences as a solar photographer, the techniques and filters he uses, and tips on processing solar images. This is the Bang Goes the Universe interview with Alan Friedman. The history of our worship of the sun predates written history by tens of thousands of years. A glimpse of the sunrise will no doubt fill us with the same sense of awe and respect for its power to illuminate earth, body, and mind as it has for mortal beings throughout the history of life on earth. The first of the great gods of myth, the sun has occupied the imaginations of tribes, leaders, and shaman throughout history, and its eclipse through what might have been seen as either a dance or a battle with the moon, a powerful god in its own right to our ancestors, would have been a rare and extraordinary spiritual event. Even in the first stirrings of modern religion and spiritual philosophy, the sun plays an important role. In Genesis from the Jewish Bible, for instance, the sun is the brighter of the two lights created by God to light the day, and the moon the lesser light to dimly light the night sky and the stars. The sun god, Surya, was worshipped by both Hindus and Buddhists. And the interdependence of man in the form of yang, the sun, and woman in the form of yin, the moon, as part of the cycle of daily life was celebrated in Chinese philosophy. It was the Greek philosopher Anaxagoras in the 5th century before the Common Era who made the first known insights into the true nature of eclipses and the phases of the moon. His work was later used by other Greek philosophers, Aristarchus and Eratosthenes among them, to make the first real leaps into modern cosmology, arranging the sun at the center of the solar system and measuring the size and distances of the Earth, sun, and moon. Many centuries later, during a renaissance of scientific exploration, new instruments began to be created to measure the sun's size and the qualities of its light. From Joseph Fraunhofer and William Herschel to Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kirchhoff, to William Huggins and George Ellery Hale, the study of the sun continued to lead us ever deeper into an understanding of the solar system and the cosmos beyond. The sun is without question the most formidable force in human daily life, and no more awesome spectacle exists than the viewing of a total solar eclipse. So, with the coming eclipse in April of 2024, I thought it fitting to have a chat with a man who is one of the finest amateur solar photographers of the day, Alan Friedman. What follows is my talk with him. Hi, Alan. How are you? Great. Welcome to the show. Glad you could be here. Thanks for inviting me. So how long have you been interested in astronomy? How'd you get into it? Pretty easy to remember. I can't remember dates too well, but I remember when my kids were little. Uh, the only time that I wasn't needed was in the middle of the night. And that's when I started... Uh, with astronomy. So my kids are in their uh, mid thirties now. So figure 30, 30 years ago, plus a couple. And how did you, how did you get started? Once you realized you wanted to get into it, what, what'd you do next? Well, <clears throat> the impetus for me was like, it is for a lot of people who get into astronomy. Uh, there was a guy, a neighbor who had a telescope, pulled it out on the busy street in downtown Buffalo with a stepladder and was inviting people to climb up and take a look at Saturn. And I climbed up and took a look at Saturn and I couldn't believe it. And this was more than 30 years ago. And I thought right. I have to get one of these things so I can experience this whenever I want to. And that was, that was the first for me. And when I do a talk often uh, I'll ask that question to the audience of astronomers, and I'd say 70% of them will have that same story. It was Saturn in a dark place somewhere that made them realize they had to have more of this. 
Yeah, I've uh, certainly uh, was a witness to a couple of star parties that I, I uh, kind of dumbed onto more or less. I remember one at uh, Griffith, Griffith Observatory in LA when it was out at the mm-hmm. Huntington doing research for the first book. And it's just, it's incredible. And I've been on the other end of that too, um, showing people the stars and and getting that. Um, seems like every time I did that, I haven't done it for a while, but every time I did do it, I got uh, somebody, to, somebody asked me if I was an astrologer, <laughs> which was... <laughs> One of the, one of the things that happens. I um, have a whole collection of sign cards, Alan Friedman, astrologer. <laughs> <I collect them. laughs> it's great. It's great. No offense, guys. If you think it's astrology, it's actually astronomy. And they were once upon a time pretty closely linked. So, so it's fine. Um, so, so it wasn't always about photography, right? So how did you go then from just a a glancing view of Saturn to the photography side of things? It's a good question because nowadays everybody is taking pictures of everything because they've got a they've got a telephone in their back pocket, which is also a pretty good camera. Right. Um, in the early days, the experiential part of it was unbelievably moving and it was more than enough for me and then uh at some point i decided i wanted to try and capture pictures of these things that i was seeing and be able to share them and i have to say it's a mixed bag Uh, i've never had a night where i've been outside with a telescope looking at the planets looking at the stars or galaxies and gone to bed freezing cold not having learned something that I didn't know when I got up that morning. Mm -hmm. And I can't say the same is true with astrophotography. There are a lot of nights I go to bed and say, I have just wasted five hours of my day. And I (laughs) wish I hadn't done it. So that is something to keep in mind as you think about this hobby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Your favorite subject does seem to be the sun, although you have uh, some wonderful images on your website of the moon and planets. what is it about the sun that that so captivates you? Well, the sun has a number of unique features um, compared to other solar system objects. I'm a solar system guy because I live in downtown Buffalo. My <clears throat> observing mount is in my backyard, 30 feet from my back door, which is where you can always do your best work when your stuff is close at hand. And from the city, I can't see deep stuff. You know, it's just too bright. Right. But there's no impact on the planets and the moon and the sun. And the thing the sun has going for it, aside from that it's up in the daytime. So if you want to look at it, and I'm fortunate enough to own my business so I can go into work late in the morning if I have a a date with the sun first, um, it, it makes it easy. I don't have to. It gets a lot harder to stay up into the night and miss a night's sleep as you get older. Um, I used to be able to recover after a day, you know, now it takes yeah. a better part of a week to recover from it without <laughs> sleep. Right. So the sun doesn't have that. It's easier to share because people are always available in the daytime. Schools are open in the daytime. Libraries are open in the daytime. So you can share the public side of it easier with the sun. But the sun is amazing because it looks different every day. The prominences, sometimes they repeat, but every day you have a prominence that you didn't see the day before. Um, And another thing that's unique about it, all the other things in the sky are basically the same size whenever you look at them. Challenging. Saturn is, you know, this big. Yeah. Slightly bigger. Um, And the sun puts out prominences. One day, a prominence can be out that's 500,000 miles into space. And when it's that big, you can take a picture of it in poor conditions, which is something you can't do with Jupiter and Saturn. It's got to be steady sky, good seeing, as we say, astronomically, when the air turbulence is low. Mm. With the sun, if there's something big going on, you can take a beautiful picture of it without having perfect conditions. So it's got a lot of things going for it that don't Mm. exist with other solar system objects. Yeah, for sure. Uh Talk about the the camera or cameras you use. I think you use a couple of different telescopes. Do you shoot differently um, with one uh, rather than the uh, than the other? 
Well, the main difference in telescopes is the aperture and the focal length. Okay. So aperture gives you potential for resolution, mm -hmm. which is not that big an issue with the sun. It's always 93 million miles away. Mm -hmm. There's only so much resolution you can get during the daytime. So using a really big telescope is often not worth the effort of lugging it out. In terms of focal length, that determines the magnification, how big the sun is in the field of view. And right. we think about this a lot with the eclipse coming up, because you've got to decide what story you're going to tell. Is it the sun this big with the sky all around it and the corona going out? Or are you going to zoom in and look to try and see the prominences that are visible during the eclipse? Mm. So the different telescopes have very different magnifications possible. And depending on the story I'm going to tell that day, whether it's a full disc portrait of the sun or just a portrait of a very interesting small area, I'll determine which scope uh, to pull out. I get it. Okay. And you mentioned uh, in one of your interviews uh, that, I, that I've that i seen, I think it was your TEDx talk, which was fascinating, um, the process of lucky imaging. Can you describe that for... For the listeners? <clears throat> I, I don't know how it got its name, Lucky Imaging. <laughs> um, but where you really need lucky, lucky Imaging is if you're going to set a camera up in the back of a telescope with a traditional shutter release and try and snap that shutter at the moment that the seeing is good. So you have to imagine you're looking at the sun in the atmosphere and all of the turbulence, the heat coming off the roofs, the uh, heat coming off the asphalt driveways, it's all making the image move and undulate and blur. And every once in a while, you get a sharp moment. But to try and time that with a shutter of a camera is virtually impossible. It's just not instantaneous enough. So lucky imaging is using streaming cameras pretty much like the webcam that we're using to record this uh, this discussion. Um, I use industrial streaming cameras. I have a, several of them, basically different pixel uh, resolutions. And they capture the, the streaming image, like video, basically, of my observing session. The beauty of it is I can focus real time looking at my laptop. The image is going to my laptop, and I'm watching it real time. So I can use the focuser and focus on the screen. No question if I'm in focus or not. And when the seeing stabilizes, I will hit the record button. And I'll generally record about 1200 frames. I see a counter at the bottom of my screen showing me how many frames have elapsed. At the end of that, I have software which analyzes these 1200 frames and picks out the sharpest one first and the worst one last. And it does a pretty good job of doing that. I always look at it by eye to make sure that it did a good job. But basically what I've got then is the movie reorganized with the sharpest frames first, the worst blurriest ones at the end. And then I say, how many do I want to work with? Usually I'll take 300 out of 1200 or so, um, about 20, 25% uh, maybe. And I will then stack them, which is the process of averaging those frames so I increase the amount of signal to the noise, which is inherent in video frames. And at the end, I've got the best of the best that I can then process further uh, to make my uh, my images. Wow, that's fascinating. I was not prepared for all of that. <laughs> I was one because one of the things, you know, I looked at the process of lucky imaging and without really understanding exactly how it was now, I mean, everybody, NASA, everyone who who takes images of especially deep space objects is stacking images. Uh, so I kind of understood that. But this process of using software to prioritize clarity is really nice uh, because, you you know, I was thinking to myself, how long does it take him to go through all of these images? Uh, so this makes total sense to me now. Uh, it must be much easier than... Uh, to build an approach, you can basically, uh, like you said, you want to tell a certain story um, on a given day, whether you're going to shoot a section of the limb and see what prominences or whatever are going on there, or you want to get a broader uh, view of the the solar um, body. Um, 
you can you can basically set it up that way and then you're just organized you're just watching for the for the the best seeing or several of the best seeing and then you just press record and what a what a brilliant idea <laughs> Well, you know, there's a there's a talk. I think it's in my TED talk as well. There's an image which I refer to often, which is taken by the Nordic Optical Telescope in the Canary Islands. It was released in 1990, I believe, and it was the sharpest image of Saturn uh, ever taken from Earth at that time. Um, and it's a good image, but lucky imaging transformed the ability of amateurs with decent sized telescopes to take good resolution pictures of Saturn. And it's come a long way since I basically stopped doing that in the uh, around uh, 2010, when Saturn sort of took a nosedive in my backyard. Um, but it's, it's startling to look at the difference that uh, amateurs have been able to achieve with 10 to 14 inch telescopes. My telescope is 10 inches, my big one in aperture. The Canary Island telescope is 2.5 meters. So it is 10 times the aperture of my telescope with right. a resolving power of 100 times. So, yeah, 100 times, uh, right. So yeah. it's, it, is, um, it is it is remarkable and uh, and exciting. And, yeah, yeah. And and you, uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. And you and I have both been out to Mount Wilson. Um, and I've, I've had the, the, the incredible um, evening looking through the big telescopes the big reflectors there which are yeah. um used for public display um and uh, it's phenomenal just looking through it really gives you a sense of it and that is what i'm trying to do with bangos of the universe here is i i my background in this and the reason i've become an astronomy communicator a science communicator is I I was always curious, and um, I fell in this um, really just trying to uh, feed that curiosity, and that's where I found the subjects that eventually I began uh, studying, and it's taken me on this path. Um, what what is it for you? Why why? I mean, we understand now how you got into it, but. Why why do you do it? What makes it special to you? It's a great question uh, because there is a lot of, I hate to say competition, but, you know, with the sun, we've got right. a number of, uh, of uh, orbiting uh, space telescopes that are photographing the sun 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year in right. wavelengths that don't even get through our atmosphere. So, uh, there is a lot of other data out there telling a brilliant story of what's going on in the sun. Um, I think there is a DIY kind of fascination with all of us and doing things for ourselves, uh, getting a piece of that understanding that's personal and, uh, and uniquely ours. And I think that's what keeps me going with it. And trying to tell the say, you know, as a communicator, much in the way you are, trying to tell the story compellingly, a little differently each time, so that the story doesn't get old and tired. And that's uh, that's one of the things that I I love to do in my uh, my my work, yeah. because there's so much riffraff, so much noise out there, you know, mm. on our phones and everything that we do, trying to sell it to to, to sell to to portray a story of the universe, um, of science, of truth, you know, accuracy and tell it accurately, but still make it compelling. It's, it's an interesting proposition. And as an artist, it's something that uh, intrigues me. Yeah. One of the, one of the sh series of photos I really liked in your collection that we didn't necessarily talk about before, but it's Saturn which you've spoken about a couple of times here, but you have this series of, of photographs of Saturn that you've aligned uh, that shows um, Saturn at different stages of orbit. Do you want to talk about that series a little bit? Yeah, sure. Well, Saturn is, Saturn is fascinating because of its ring system. I mean, obviously we sure. all know that, um, but those rings move through the plane of our 
journey together with Saturn uh, as we both or orbit the sun. So the rings go through a cycle of tilt from wide open to edge on. And during the early 2000s, I think 2003 to 2009, Saturn was well placed in our sky up high um, and just begging to have its picture taken. And I had <laughs> a nice 10 inch telescope, a very rare one that I was very fortunate to get to purchase. And I used it for those six years to record um, one really sharp, accurate image of Saturn a year. That's about as many as I could get. Wow. And I created a timeline of that showing the, the rings moving from their most wide open uh, position to their edge on position and uh, and created both a tableau and an, an, an animation of it. Um, Talk about Saturn, a, the magic Saturn of is, storytelling, right? <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, Saturn is, is a thrilling object to take pictures of and probably the hardest yeah. because it's very small and the seeing has to be dead nuts stationary in order to do a good job of it. Right, sure. So I, I got a little exhausted at the end of that period. Uh, some wonderful imagers um, like Damien Peach in the UK has stayed with it and has a series of it that I did plus the other series of it opening back up again. Yeah, uh, he's he's more dedicated than I am to the planets. Yeah, uh, but it, it it was a wonderful uh, journey during those years. Right, right. Okay, well, let's talk more about you. I just I think that story is is fascinating and it really talks to the love of uh, uh, that you find in the field, uh, the more you embrace it, uh, the more you get into it, the more you dig into the science, yes, but just trying to feed your understanding of what it is you're looking at. I mean, we've all seen these incredible images coming from Hubble and there are other, as you mentioned, so many telescopes, uh, uh, observatories in the, in the sky now um, Gaia is one that comes to mind that's exploring all of these a billion suns. I mean, that, that's just unbelievable to me. Um, and it's, you know, to, to hear, just wanted people to understand you know, just how dedicated a citizen astronomer such as yourself, as you like to call yourself, a uh, I like it. I like neighborhood astronomer as well. Um, that speaks to the guy on the street with his telescope uh, showing other people. Um, it just, yeah, I really, I, I really, I've always, you know, I've, I've spoken with your group and others and um, it's, I love the community. Um, I like how much the community wants to embrace those in its, in the community who, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people who know a lot about, the science who are amateurs. I mean, there are a lot of them, <laughs> um, but they are really, really want to embrace people who are interested and curious. And I've found um, so many people who are, you know, when I'm giving a talk, just there for the first, this is their first meeting. And they're just seeing this, you know, in, in the early days, it was my talk on Milton Humason. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, yeah, anyway, I just, I, I really like the, I like the the communication and the community that is centered around astronomy uh, locally and regionally. I think it's, I just think it's brilliant. So I'm, I'm glad you told that story because it really brings, brings out how much time you can spend on these things if you really have a project that can take time, you know? So anyway. Um, let's, let's talk about your work. Did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you covered it great. Other than okay. I'll put in a plug, your Humison talk, Humison talk it was a wonderful talk. We were really uh, thrilled and fortunate to be able to have you come to Buffalo to, uh, to do that. So yeah, beginning of a long friendship, which is great too. Yeah, it was, it was really great. So, uh, good, good memories for sure. Um, Let's talk about some of the images from your website and, you know, just some of your work, starting with this uh, beautiful monochrome of the solar sphere. Um, there's so many, there's so much going on here with these images. One of the things that struck me was, um, well, the, the dark, the darkest 
parts of the sun and then the brightest parts, these really, really bright parts. You want to talk about what's going on here? Sure. Well, something that you need to know about much of my work on the sun is that I uh, kind of developed and then experimented for a long time with the idea of inverting the tonality in the sun. So often in my images, the detail in the chromosphere, which is what you see is the disc, it's actually the atmosphere of the sun, that detail in many of my images is inverted. And um, in the beginning, it was quite controversial because it's clearly not the values you see. The hottest areas are black and the coolest areas are white. Um, but there's something that happens when you invert the image, which I discovered early on around 2009, I guess, was that the appreciation of the three-dimensionality of the sun, the depth of these features is heightened in the inverted values of it. And astronomers and scientists have been inverting and processing data for forever because mm -hmm. we're looking to try and understand stuff, you know, sure. Uh, even though I think it makes a pretty picture, um, you ever have the pleasure or so the modified pleasure of, of going, uh, having a CAT scan and then going in with the doctor and the technician who are looking at your CAT scan to try and see if there's something to worry about there. They do all kinds of stuff to the scientific image it's taken. They invert it. They colorize it. They increase the contrast. Because the issue is to, to see what's there and to look for something that you need to discover. And so I look at my work in the same way. So that said, it is important to know that, that the tonality in the images might not be the, um, the actual tonality that you would get. But that said, the sun that I'm observing when you see all that detail is in the wavelength of hydrogen alpha light, which is a really thin slice in the deep red. So when I look through the telescope safely, which you always have to be aware of and always have to say when you talk about looking at the sun, you've got to know that the setup you have is safe. My setup is safe, and it shows this tiny slice all in red light. So there's no reason to use a color camera. All of my cameras are black and white cameras. Mm. And they record the tones only, not the color. So the colors are applied. So as you talk about a monochrome image, that is probably the closest thing to the data that I'm recording because I'm recording monochrome data. And I often love to just work with the tones and prepare an image just with the contrast of the information and not get involved in the colorizing mm. because color is just so seductive. You know, it I is. my whole life is a screen printer and I'm still confused about color. I right. don't know, you know, I shoot when I do landscape photography i shoot black and white cameras only because it's just yeah it's easier for me to understand so yeah. i do love those monochromatic images they're some of my favorites yeah it's it's uh, really interesting and that goes out to the deeper space images too they are often colorized to bring out the the different uh, uh gases involved try and in, sell in a the... color picture i mean a black and white picture to a news uh, news service yeah it's just not that nobody wants it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's it's not as pretty. It just isn't. Um the, okay, well, let's move to the the color image. You've got a, a we have a close-up um of just one section um with an enormous solar prominence um over the limb and these filaments, these squiggly filaments in there um around uh, what are what is at least one looks like pretty active um region of the sun it's fascinating well that's you want to talk about that prominence or just the features that we're looking sure. at here i mean that that's an image that uh i titled solar saurus um i do enjoy titling my works uh there's a there's a phenomenon called uh, pareidolia which is our tendency to see earthly forms and shapes and anthropomorphic shapes in clouds. And you can see them in solar prominences as well. They often look like stuff. That was a very massive prominence. It stayed visible for quite a few days. And I did photograph it over a number of days. 
but that uh, that color image was the best of them. It was um, actually featured as a NASA astronomy picture of the day uh, in the year that it was done. I forgetting the actual measurements, but I think using an, an Earth scale and it, it's something like four hundred thousand miles long. Wow! Um, and it's to the moon and back. Yeah, that's almost right. <laughs> and it's uh, it's just tremendous, highly detailed. Um, and it it was so exciting to to take a picture of it. There are services which show from from in several major observatories uh, that show what's going on on the sun in hydrogen alpha light light mm -hmm. at a given moment. So I always look at those in the morning uh, when I get up and and at night before I go to bed just to see what the story of the sun is for that day. And when I see something like that, it's got to be a complete cloud cover for me not to set up my telescope the next day. So that was a, that was a good one. And you're right. It's got filaments, which are only their filaments and prominences are the same thing, but filaments right. are prominences seen against the disc of the sun instead of against the background of space. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. got a dramatic active region in there too. So it really is a, uh, a solar, uh, uh, uh what would you call it? Panoply. It's just a, a very rich moment at that point of this uh, of history and at that uh, part of the sun. And I yeah. took pictures of it for several days. Yeah. Did you do you ever you talked about um, going to bed wondering why you spend so much time <laughs> on a given image, but. This must have, especially in the early run, and I, I wonder if that if the magic is still there to the same extent. But the first time you turned the lights out after capturing something like this, that must have been a pretty incredible feeling. Yeah, yeah, it's not a really good sleep inducing uh, uh, behavior. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to go to bed really excited about something even in a good way because it makes it hard to fall asleep um but no it is uh it, it is the thrill the thrill of the moment i mean yeah. astronomy brings us moments and these are very personal moments when i've taken a picture of something i'm excited about but being able to see the transit of venus in front of the sun with a bunch of other people who've never seen it before from mount wilson um Amazing. Attending a solar eclipse, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, these are just very important life experiences where we get to just feel the power of the universe in a way that only, you can only do when you realize that things happen briefly and they're not going to happen again for a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, it, it helps you understand your tiny place in it all and yet still love your place and your ability to have a part in this giant uh, theater of, uh, of the universe. So it's, yeah, it's I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting his name now, but uh, one of the astronomers, one of the astrophysicists I've really enjoyed listening to on the subject, um, it's usually on the subject of why religion, but I think he put it beautifully in that he said that, the it, uh, the in a sense you can think about the earth and we're present our presence on it as the universe having birthed itself um or been birthed um coming together in, here on earth and probably elsewhere but here on earth anyway as far as we know to discover itself and to think about itself. And I think it's a really romantic way mm -hmm. of quixotic way of, of thinking about our presence um, in the world. Yeah. It's a lovely way of thinking about it. I think. I you. Yeah. Um, moving right along the giant peach, uh, the lunar eclipse. I remember the first one I can I probably saw these as a kid. My mom and dad were both kind of attuned to this stuff. But uh, the first one I remember was I walked out. I was visiting my dad down in Florida, and I walked out to look at the the moon under an eclipse. And this is pretty much what I saw, but smaller, <laughs> but pretty much what I saw. 
You're, you're thinking of the lunar eclipse. The lunar eclipse, yes. Yeah. Did I say solar? <laughs> I meant you lunar. didn't, but I but okay. there are yeah. there are different types of um, eclipses. Yeah. The lunar yeah. eclipse happens um, much more frequently mm -hmm. um, and much more obs observably. Uh, yeah. Because when the uh, uh, the moon is in the Earth's shadow, uh, the whole nighttime world gets to see it. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, it's it's less rare, uh, yep. easier to come across, and it is it is beautiful. Uh, right. the, the, that moon in the Earth's shadow, kind of being colorized by all the sunrises and sunsets all around the edge of the Earth, uh, turning into a, a shade of red that nobody can predict what it will be until it happens. Is it going to be blood red? Is it going to be claret? Is it going to be pink? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always a surprise and it is, it is very beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, you said blood red, um, there, there are, um, ancient mythologies wherein, um, the lunar eclipse was thought to be a, um, a battle, um, mm -hmm. between various forces. And, uh, there are stories about how the, um, the, the rulers, kings or emperors, uh, would be hidden when under lunar eclipse because it was thought that the moon god, very often it was the moon god, was was bloodied in the battle and they were fearing for the emperor's or the ruler's life. And so they would go away until the, the battle ended and the moon uh, god again emerged um, victorious, I'm guessing. Um, white and shiny again. <laughs> uh, re re interesting, um, just part of our part of our history of understanding and trying to make sense of our world. So the let's move. The thing about Go the lunar eclipse too quickly is that yeah. it, it's slow. It takes quite a bit of time, unlike a solar eclipse, which happens much faster because the moon's shadow is is much smaller than Earth's. Um, I, I always loved uh, um, Angela's Ashes, and in the film of Angela's Ashes, everybody comes out for a moment to watch a lunar eclipse, and they come and they see it, you're, it pans to it, and then they, it's over, and they all go inside, <laughs> and it's totally not like that at all. It takes hours, and you really have to have patience and uh, yeah, bring your cold weather gear if it's in the winter. Yeah, definitely. It's um, what a great what a great book. Um, and what a great story. Um, so let's move to the solar eclipse then, because that is, uh, a reason why I thought this would be such a well-timed interview. Uh, we are, uh, just days away from a solar eclipse that's going to pass through your area among others. And, uh, so you want to talk about your, your image of any of your images, but this one in particular looks like a partial ecl uh, eclipse. Well, I've, I've had the pleasure to observe quite a few partial eclipses. They're less, obviously less rare than being on the center line uh, of an eclipse. Um, and uh, they're, they're just always amazing. You know, it, it's often I, the, the one that I think you're, you're pointing to is one that uh, happened at sunrise. So the, the, uh, the sun came up as a very narrow horn uh, croissant and it got um, the eclipse was ending as the sun rose so the uh, the bite out of it became smaller and smaller as the sun rose out of the horizon but uh, but you're you're right I mean we are in the center line Buffalo is in the center line of this eclipse on April 8th which is the first time that that's happened in Buffalo's in 99 years and I believe the last time for 120 some odd years so um Hard to decide what to do about it. I, I was fortunate to get to see the 2017 total eclipse, uh, which was my first. So I feel that I have one, I have that experience. So rather than travel to a place where it's likely to be clear, I'm going to stick it out in Buffalo and hope for the best and uh, deal with the experience that we're given, uh, you know, with clouds or without clouds. But uh, boy, what a thrill it is. And there's so much hullabaloo about it. I mean, the anticipation of a million people coming to be in Buffalo that were not there two days before is um, uh, 
Uh, it's it's wonderful, and they're a little scary, depending on how you who you're listening to talk about <laughs> the police, the the supermarket uh, executives who don't expect to have any food. Uh, right. But um, I was trying to get up there on the train. I couldn't get a train up there. Oh, uh, really? so I'm actually going to be up there a couple of days ahead of time. I will have my bicycle with me. Um, and so I will plan to ride my bicycle under the total eclipse wow. on the 8th. I'll be up there just kind of need to go up a couple of days early and just hang out and until we yeah, until the mean, big moment just, and hope for good weather. Easy. Yeah, we'll, we'll hope, but you know, it'll happen in any event. So mm. if it's cloudy, it will happen and it will be different than I experienced in 2017, but it's still going to get dark right. and the weather is still going to change. And right. So we'll we'll see. Yeah, and, and when you when you did do you uh, shoot differently? You probably shoot differently uh, for a, to a solar eclipse, then, right? Well, yes, definitely, because yeah. doing your totality is the one moment that you can look at the sun without uh, optical interference. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun is completely covered by the moon. You can just stare at it, and fascinatingly, you can't do that before or after, even seconds before and seconds afterward. When I watched the eclipse happening in um, Kentucky in 2017, I was watching the partial phase through a safe filter as it was streaming to my laptop. And when there was about 1% of the sun's light still visible, a tiny fingernail sliver, I glanced back over my shoulder thinking I could look. And you couldn't look at all. It was just as if the sun were fully, fully out there with no moon in front wow. of 99% of it. It was still unwatchable. And then 10 seconds later, you could turn and look at it and see the corona of the sun expanding out maybe three, four degrees on either side, all around the, the, the eclipse sun. It's, um, it's remarkable. So in that time, if you're set up for it, you do not need a filter in front of your camera. You can mm -hmm. point your camera at it, take a picture, think a little bit ahead of time about what length, focal length lens you want to use, or use your phone if you want to. Yeah. You can take a picture along with, and it will be one of the 10 million photographs that will be presented on social media the next day <laughs> or later right. that day of the sun. So yeah. don't go crazy with it. If it's your first eclipse, soak it in. Don't. Yeah. And that's what I did the first time. I have one picture that I that I captured of that eclipse, or one that I published. I did have some others, but yeah. I only released one picture, and uh, I'm very happy to have had that chance. But it That's will great. not rely on you to be the the documentarian of that. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, this is such a rich history of of filming and photographing. We won't get into it, but uh, of uh, for various reasons, and you, you know, Einstein comes to mind, and some of his work in the early twentieth century, and what that spawned, and how the sun's um, solar eclipses were used to try to identify and and prove mm. some of his his ideas. It was it's just it's really fascinating. But just as a gaze, stargazer, it is our parent star, and there's nothing like uh, having a chance to to see it in a way that you just ordinarily don't and can't. Um, so yeah. yeah. Uh, next image is the and I don't you got to explain this to me. So d the you have images of the International Space Station transiting the sun. Uh, was this a planned event or found object? How did this <laughs> come together? No, you have to plan carefully for those. It uh, it takes uh, it, its longest, about two-fifths of a second for the space station to scoot in front of the sun. So that's one of those things that wow. the only way you can shoot it is with a video interface of some sort. And you've got to, you know, take a lot of frames uh, and think ahead of time how you're going to expose them in order to get that silhouette of the space station in front of the sun. I've done it five or six wow. times. Okay. Uh, I have a friend uh, locally in our club who keeps track and gets notifications from the couple of websites that predict these constantly. Um, they do happen frequently, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very narrow event. I don't remember what the actual width is, but 
something like a thousand yards uh, for the availability to see it when it's in your neighborhood. So you've got to be positioned well or you'll miss it. Wow. And then you've got to know the time exactly and start capturing a couple of minutes ahead to a couple of minutes after. And then when you examine the video, you will you can actually see it if you're watching on the screen. It just basically right. is like, and you see this little dark thing. But that happens a lot because birds fly in front of the sun all the time. Right. And so you're always seeing little bits of stuff like floaters in your vision, you know, right. passing in front of the uh, your image of the sun. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun. And if you if you do it right and you use a fast enough shutter, you can capture pretty extraordinary detail in the uh, International Space Station as it uh, passes in front of the sun. The yeah, that you, that you have there is a close up that was captured. The full disc of the sun was captured. And I did it on the first day of spring, uh, the first day of summer, the um, the equinox, not the equinox, the solstice, uh, the summer solstice, two years apart, I think 20, 2020 and 2022. Both of those days, it just has so happened there was a transit in our general neighborhood. And the first one was in the midst of solar minimum, where the sun's activity is very low, and you can almost have a full year without one sunspot appearing. And that is the only thing happening on the surface of the sun in that picture. If you go to the full uh, the full disk image, right. completely blank. I but noticed that, yeah. Thing. And then two years later, the sun had come alive again. So there were active regions and prominences and the same little silhouette of the space station. I process right. both of them very similarly so that you can compare them and see how things change over time. Even if yeah. the space station stays the same and comes back for a visit, the sun is totally different. So. Amazing. Yeah, you can see the, you can make out clearly the solar wings and the main module. And it's really, yeah, really, really a, cool. There's a docked um, uh, um, uh, vehicle in there as well mm. uh, during one of those if you if you do your homework and look at what was going on the space station on that day you not only know that that's there but you know who's inside of it and wonder wow. if they're looking at you while you're looking at them, them right yeah wow it's a fascinating image uh the last one i i selected was this dual uh image where you've split between filters. I thought that would be interesting, especially for uh, those who might be, you know, looking to try to get into this themselves. So can you talk about that? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great choice. I don't use that image too much. I made it quite some time ago, but what it is, is a, a composite image of the photosphere of the sun, I believe on the right, which is what you would see through solar eclipse glasses or through a very inexpensive but safe, what we call a white light solar filter. It, um, it shows the surface of the sun and any sunspots that might be visible. With a larger outlay of, uh, of cash, you can get a hydrogen alpha filter, which is the one we spoke about earlier, which narrows the wavelength of light down to about a slice maybe one ten billionth, less than one ten billionth of a meter wide in the mm. deep red. And that shows you all that activity of the chromosphere. Chromosphere is called the atmosphere of the sun. It's a higher layer, uh, which is why that um, that side of the image is, uh, is larger. Um, that is not to scale, but the chromosphere is further out into space. Mm. Um, and it shows all of the juicy stuff that we get to see and that <laughs> fuels the purchase of those filters, the chrominant, the uh, prominences, the whirls and swirls of the chromosphere, the, uh, the beautiful depth in the active regions. So yeah. there's so, a lovely prominence on the, on the left side of that image on that particular day as well. Yeah. It's really neat. Those are great. Um, and there are many, many more on your website and Instagram. Uh, for anybody who uh, would like to check out more of Alan's work, uh, go to avertedimagination.com and check it out. It's remarkable stuff. I'll mention that again later. But um, what advice do you have for you know amateurs looking to get started, particularly in photography? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have any kind of telescope, 
uh, you definitely want to either buy or make a safe solar filter for it, utilizing the material uh, made by Bader Planetarium in Germany. It's, um, it's available in this country from a number of sources. Uh, Astrophysics in uh, Rockford, Illinois, uh, is the distributor for the material. You can buy a sheet of it and you can make your own solar filter uh, quite easily. I've made one for every telescope I have, and I bought a few of them too. It's inexpensive, and it will show you the sun in white light, which is, I mean, it seems once you've looked at a hydrogen alpha image or, or looked at the sun in hydrogen alpha, it may not seem that exciting. But when you think about it, the sun is out there, if you're lucky and live in Arizona, 300 days a year, and you never see it. You can't look at it. So your first time seeing the sun as a disk with an active region on it, um, it's mind blowing. It's, it is basically hiding in plain sight every day that you can see it. So just that is a wonderful way to get started. And that type of material, uh, it, as of yesterday, it was still available at Astrophysics. Uh, those guys are all headed to, um, to Texas for the eclipse. So yeah. we'll have to order soon um, this mm -hmm. week maybe, but uh, but you can still have that and make something, you can make a cover for a telescope or for binoculars if you want a little magnification uh, to see the partial eclipse other than with a pair of, uh, of mylar glasses. Uh, that's a great thing to have. And I think yeah. it's the best way to get started. Okay, great, great. Um, let's talk briefly about the Buffalo Astronomical Association and uh, and like groups. Um, what are the benefits of that? You've been a long time. You were the president of the club uh, for a, a while, and I think you are now the director, um, currently the director. What um, Can you talk about that? I've certainly enjoyed the experiences I've had there. Well, sure. To, to be fair, I stepped down from my um, honorary position on the board of the BAA this past year, just to mm -hmm. open it up. I've been on the board for, for more than 20 years. It was a good time to get some new voices uh, uh, involved. But uh, the BAA and all of the astronomy organizations, I'm sure there's one in whatever city or community you live in, uh, these are wonderful groups of people who come together really because of a common love for nature and the night sky and the wonders that uh, that you know are there. And uh, they're always inexpensive to join. They give of themselves freely to the community around. Um, I mean, I think I mentioned I have six talks I'm giving this month, but all of them because of my hobby. Uh, the BAA's got 10 talks a day that they're doing <laughs> for right. organizations all over Western New York to try and prepare people for what's going to happen and to encourage them not to miss it. Um, I can't speak highly enough about uh, these groups. Um, they really are, you know, community-based science in the best possible way, who love more than anything to share the view of the night sky with, um, with their fellow community members. And great if you, to get involved, you don't have to be a scientist to get involved in them. You know, they're, there are people from all walks of life who only share an interest in the wonders of the universe, and uh, that uh, that can be anyone and should be everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your plan for the eclipse? Do you have a, a specific idea in mind, or are you just going to see see what happens? Well, the one literally. So the partial eclipse picture I think you shared earlier was taken from the rooftop of my office building, which is a wonderful converted Model T factory, six stories high with a big flat roof. And I went up there to, to get a good view of, of sunrise. I've been invited to come up on the roof of, of the building uh, that day as well, and I may do that. But I've pretty much determined that the sun is gonna be visible from my backyard. The sun's gonna be up about 45 degrees in the sky uh, that at that time of the day on April 8th. And it's going to clear the trees in the neighbor's yard. So I might just stay home. I'm sort of waiting to see the forecast, waiting to see what pandemonium is like in my area. And if I want to try and uh, go somewhere and bring equipment with me. Um, but certainly if there's any chance of seeing it, I will set up uh, both to watch it and photograph it. 
and uh, invite uh, whoever, you know, in my immediate community of family and friends uh, to join me wherever I go. Right. And it uh, should be a great party day in Buffalo. Yeah, that's great. Do um, you want to talk briefly about your website? And do you have any events coming up uh, aside from the, the eclipse? I do, actually. So I... We have a wonderful art museum in Buffalo. We have two of them, and they're across the street from each other. The newly renovated Albright Knox uh, uh, Gallery is spectacular. Um, across the street from it is the Birchfield Penny Art Center, which is um, houses the collection of Charles Birchfield's brilliant watercolor paintings from the, uh, the 20th century. And uh, the curators there had the idea, he, he did a lot with nature and was very interested in the moon and the sun, and they appear in his, um, in his paintings. The curators put together a show which combines his watercolors with my images of the sun, um, called Astral Visions, uh, works of Charles Birchfield and Alan Friedman. I'm Interesting. Thrilled, thrilled to be a, to be in, you know, part of that. The show is, is beautiful. And that is open uh, through June. And this Sunday, I'll be giving a talk on my work, um, an in-person talk, which is great fun after doing tons of Zoom conversations. I'll be able to hear an audience and, mm -hmm. and uh, tell a few stories and see the reactions, hear the reactions of people. So that's this Sunday at 2 o'clock. And I have, uh, I'll also be doing a talk at our uh, synagogue next Friday night. Um, and that'll draw to a close, I think, my public speaking engagements and allow me to focus on getting my my gear together and my plans together for the eclipse. Yes. Uh, but Averted Imagination is my site. Um, if you're wondering about the name, it comes from the fact that averted vision, which is what we use to see dim things through a telescope, you have to not look at things that are dim because the dim sensors in your eye for dim light are not centered in your vision. So you avert your vision slightly. Anyway, the short story is that avertedvision.com was already taken. Averted imagination is when a young kid in your astronomy club calls you over and says, hey, Alan, I've got five galaxies in the field of view of my telescope. Come take a look. And he's got 18-year-old eyes and I've got 70 year old eyes and I look and I don't see a thing. I say, <laughs> yeah, Tom, I think I see it. I think I see three. That is a bird in imagination. Uh, and that was the name of my website. And uh, I'd love to have you visit. Contact me through there. There's an email uh, way to uh, to send me links. There's the old site, which you'll reach at a bird imagination. If you click on that, it'll take you to my more recent work, which is fully uh, solar focused. Yeah, and uh, you don't have to avert your imagination much when you visit it. I will tell you that. Um, I'll give you the final word. Any last uh, interpretations or, or or anything you want to leave the audience about uh, astronomy, astronomy clubs, the world of astronomy for, for amateurs or citizens, as you like to call yourself, um, you get the final word. Sure. Well, I'll think of the uh, the closing of my my talks, uh, which has pretty much been the same thing for the years I've been doing this. Um, public astronomy is really my passion. I love I love imaging things, but sharing the views through my telescope is one of the most fulfilling things that I've ever had the privilege of, uh, of being able to do as, a, as an astronomer. And that got uh, really put to the wayside during the pandemic. I haven't been out doing that hasn't been safe to do it. And I'm so thrilled to be out doing that again. Um, the view through a telescope is a, is a game changer. It's a mind changer. I think I have a picture of me showing the universe uh, through my telescope to a young kid. And then the words come up, um, this machine opens the universe, which is a I'll tell you what it comes from and you can cut it out if you want to. But uh, I always love the picture of Woody Guthrie playing his guitar with the, the words hand scrolled on it. This machine kills fascists. And, um, <laughs> I, I like to think of that with my telescope. It That's certainly great. makes you makes you want to know more, makes you want to understand what is true versus what is imaginary and um Sharing it is the most powerful thing uh, that I've had the opportunity to do in my life, and I'm thrilled to, to get back to it.
Alan Friedman is an award-winning solar photographer, a research associate in astronomy at the Buffalo Museum of Science, and I guess former president and director of the Buffalo Astronomical Association. But still a member. Still a member. Um, his website, avertedimagination.com, features dozens of samples of his work in astrophotography, including images of the sun, moon, and planets. And you can also find him on Instagram, at Averted Imagination. And Alan, thanks so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. For me too. So good to see you, Ron. You too. That concludes this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to like or subscribe to the show for updates on future episodes as they're published. We really appreciate the support. If you have questions or comments about or for current or future episodes, please leave them in the comments section or email them to me at contact at ronvoller.com. Bang Goes the Universe is written, produced, and hosted by me, Ron Voller. Thanks to Mark Voller for providing the theme music. We'll see you next time. <laughs>